First thing you notice when seeing pictures or videos of the protests in Israel are Israeli flags. You see the flags everywhere. I know here and in Israel too, to a certain extent, this idea of flag waving has come to be associated with a right-wing perspective. I know it's strange for me if I'm driving down the street and a truck passes me with a bunch of American flags off the back. Um, I have my ideas about who might be behind the wheel. I could be entirely wrong. But we make these associations. And in Israel, sometimes that flag waving is associated with the right-wing contingent with settlers uh, making a stand on, uh, on hilltops and proclaiming areas as being for Israel and putting it in the face of the Palestinians. It can be used as that kind of symbol. But Israel and Israelis in general are very patriotic, are people who really love their country and hold it to high ideals to which, like any country, it doesn't always live up to. But today, we are seeing those flags tremendously. So many flags being held on the side of buildings and homes, being held out on the streets. You've seen the videos, I'm sure. You've seen the photographs. I hear from my family, my friends, from people from our congregation who are traveling in Israel. So many people on the streets, waving Israeli flags, chanting, shutting down major streets, demanding to be heard. 100,000 people on the streets, 200, 250,000, 500,000, 600,000 people on the streets of Israel. The numbers grow night after night, in a country of only nine million civilians, citizens, having a half a million people on the streets on a given night, protesting, is a tremendous, tremendous statement. My cousin talked to me about how strange it is to have an Israeli flag, a sign of patriotism be a sign of defiance. But that's where they are right now. The protesters see themselves as defenders of Israel, as defenders of the ideals of Israel that they believe in. Among those 100,000, 500,000, 600,000 who have been on the streets are my family. My cousin took his newborn daughter to her first protest. Isn't that love? No pressure. <laughs> and there were a group not long ago, a group of 250 reform rabbis who had our annual convention. This year had the annual convention in Israel. I was sorry that I couldn't be among them. They joined the protests. This past week, one of the most dramatic weeks in, is, in Israeli history, 200 Portland Jews joined with Jewish Federation of Greater Portland on a trip that had been postponed for years because of the pandemic, were in Israel at this incredibly dramatic time and seeing those protests firsthand. 
whole families, young people, old people, all out on the streets. The protests are peaceful protests. But as we know here in Portland, as we had this experience, sometimes peaceful protests can be met with violence and with brutal suppression. I heard from one of the leaders of the reform movement in Israel who was drenched by a water cannon on his way to one protest and as he was leaving that protest to go to another. There is so much tension that's there. And as joyful as it may seem to see these protests on the street, and I know from our protests here, there could be a sense of joy when you are out there making a stance, making a proclamation, fighting for something you really believe in. But it's also quite dangerous, not only because of the threats of violence, but also because of the incredible fragility that Israel is, is feeling right now, this tension. What is it that they're protesting about? Israel is a democracy, is this young state. It is a young and fragile democracy, not yet 75 years old. Israel hasn't had the time that other democratic countries have had to build these long-lasting institutions. It is a country that was attacked by its neighboring countries on the day of its birth, and it has been at war every single day since by nations, by terrorists, under threat for its existence. And during all of that time, there has not been time, there has not been unity, there has not been political will to draft a constitution. The laws of the state of Israel are based on the common law of the British occupiers who had been before them and the robust case law that has developed over these 75 years. Its principles are based in Jewish law and Jewish history, and they are recorded in Israel's Declaration of Independence, the closest thing that Israel has to a constitution. Paragraph 13 of Israel's Declaration of Independence provides that the state of Israel will be based on freedom, justice, and peace as envisioned by the prophets of Israel, it will ensure complete equality of social and political rights to all of its inhabitants, irrespective of religion, race, or sex. That one statement, that statement of pluralism, of unity, of respect for minorities, of an ideal towards peace, has been the theoretical basis of the state of Israel, if not always its practical reality. Having that statement has been something that has given a lot of reassurance over the years to the Israeli population, especially to women and to minorities. However, the Knesset has maintained that that declaration is neither law or an ordinary legal document. The Supreme Court has ruled that guarantees, those kinds of guarantees, are merely guiding principles. The Declaration is not, in fact, constitutional law, and it is, makes practical ruling on its upholding or nullification of various ordinance and statutes. In fact, Israel as a government has very few checks and balances. We in the United States are accustomed to a very robust system of checks and balances. And we've also seen horrific norm breaking that has happened that has threatened even our old democracy with very strong institutions. And we can see that when someone comes in with a idea of breaking norms, that democracies don't always hold, are not always robust enough 
to stand on their own. Israel has not two houses of parliament, but only one. And a Supreme Court with no constitution to ultimately guide it. Practically speaking, over these almost 75 years, the Supreme Court in Israel has been what the people have relied on to be a check on the power of the Knesset, of the Israeli government, a protector of minority rights, an insurance that the prophetic vision that was laid out is carried out in practicality. The two institutions are very different. And by keeping them separate, they tend to be a check and a balance on each other. But the current government, the most right wing in Israel's history, only a few months old, sees the Supreme Court as an unelected barrier to the will of the governing majority. And perhaps in a sense, they're right. Perhaps Israel needs exactly that powerful check on the tyranny of the majority. Maybe that is what Israel needs. We know that majorities can often, if left with no checks on it, become tyrannical, can become dismissive of minorities. It's fair to say that while this government was democratically elected like our own system, the final product does not necessarily reflect the will of the majority of the people. In its exercise of raw power, a small minority asking as if it acting as if it has the mandate of the people to severely restrain the power of the Supreme Court, to allow whatever majority of the moment to reshape the balance of power and act with impunity. And that's exactly what's happening right now. This very right-wing, extreme, extremist right-wing. Small parties that were needed to create a governing coalition that normally most Israelis would not give much of a thought to suddenly are in government and are exercising their power and putting demands on the central parties because they say they can leave at any moment if their demands are not met. Some of this is going on in our own country and our own government. So we know well what that means. Members of this extremist parties have expressed a rejection for equal rights for women, for LGBTQ, for Arabs, for Palestinians, for other minorities in Israel. There is a fear that an unbounded reactionary government could outright annex the West Bank and undermine any hopes for a peaceful agreement with the Palestinians and make Israel into a pariah state. This past week was perhaps the most dramatic in Israel's history and certainly the most dramatic week of the protests. The prime minister, as we've all read, fired his defense minister who dared to suggest that there should be a pause on this legislation in support of the protesters. The outrage on the street from that and the support of the protesters from Israel's other most important institutions, the military and labor unions, forced the Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu to declare a pause on this legislation going forward. Now that pause, that is good news. And people who've been in these protests breathed a sigh of relief, as well as recognized that a pause is nothing more than a ceasefire and an opportunity for both sides to regroup. The pause is for Pesach. As the session is ending, it's nice to remember that Israel runs on the Jewish calendar, right? <laughs> and right after Yom Hatzmaut, Israel's Independence Day, when Israel will seven, celebrate, its 75th year, the session will begin again, and the Prime Minister is promising that these laws will be brought up. He is saying that over these next few weeks, that there will be negotiations, that there will be conversations. The President of Israel, a ceremonial role, but still someone who carries some 
weight in Israel, has made a proposal of a compromise agreement, which the government immediately rejected, but perhaps can be the basis for ongoing conversation. The fear, of course, is that there will not be conversation, there will not be negotiation, and come the next session of Parliament that we will be right back where we started. And the protesters, I hear from them directly, are not giving up, are not saying we've done our job, are not resting on their laurels. This is an incredibly important time, and we in the United States know what this feels like. We who experienced January 6th and know the fragility of our institutions, know what it feels like, know the fear that can happen when tyranny lurks. We have an opportunity right now to stand with our friends. Yesterday I was on a Zoom call with leadership from the Union for Reform Judaism, the reform movement's uh, major institution in North America. Uh, and along with our leaders were the leaders of the Israeli reform movement. The reform movement has been at the front of these protests from the very beginning, we were told. We see these protests with hundreds of thousands of people in the streets of Tel Aviv and in Jerusalem but Israel is not just its metropolitan centers. All over the country, these protests are happening in much smaller numbers. And it has been reform synagogues that have been the center of those protests all around the country. The reform movement has, hold on to your hats for this, 55 reform synagogues in the country. If you've been following the history of reform in Israel and of the conservative movement, and all non-Orthodox branches of Judaism in Israel. You know that the story is that it's teeny tiny and no one knows about it and no Israelis go to it. Not true anymore. 55 Israeli reform synagogues in the country. And the conservative movement is doing well as well. And that is because over these past couple of years, they have fought for the rights of non-Orthodox Jews to have conversions, life cycle events, to have full participation in the Jewish life of, of Israel in the center of the Holy Land, to be able to have women pray at the Kotel, at the most sacred site in Judaism. That has gone well and not well, and it continues to be a problem, but progress gets made. And great gains have been made over these past couple of years. The fear now from our leaders is that all of that could be turned backwards. And all these Israeli Jews who have discovered, as we all know from the young Israeli uh, gay men who come to Portland to have their kids through surrogacy, no pressure, <laughs> and know that they experience a Judaism that they didn't they, don't, they didn't know, they didn't grow up with. That's not what they saw. They see Jewish religious life as being only, only ultra-Orthodox. And when they come here and they experience the warmth and the embrace, they go back and they tell their friends and they experience back in Israel. And we tell them, you don't have to come here. It's there for you. You have these opportunities in Israel. You can have a vibrant, modern, excited, joyful experience of your Jewish life. A surprise to most young Israelis. Never occurred to them that that might be available. All of that is at risk. An extreme right-wing government can turn all, with no checks on its power, can turn all of that back. We have a stake in this. We, American Jews, North American Jews, speak to my Canadian friends who are here too, we recognize that these are hard fought and they're important because we believe in a vibrant Israel that is leading and not lagging, that is helping all of us to have a fulfilled Jewish life, that is respectful of its minorities, 
that places women as equal partners in religious life, something we take for granted, but is a shock and surprise to many Israelis in religious life. We have grown accustomed. I certainly grew up in a world where we're always told not to criticize Israel, where we're always told not to meddle in Israeli affairs, to give support, to be the ones who always say, go Israel, to be the ones who go and to visit and to spend our money there. And that's right too. But this moment is different. And our Israeli friends are telling us that it's different. Our Israeli friends are telling us that they need us. They need us to stand up for them. A week or so ago, there was a letter that was circulated among Jewish members of the House in Washington uh, and encouraging the Prime Minister of Israel to negotiate along the lines that the, uh, that the President of Israel was laying out. Many of our Congress people signed that letter. Not all. I'm happy to say Representative Bonamici was among those who signed it. We're very grateful to her for that. And we recognize that it's very easy to use this time to just criticize Israel completely and to use it as a way of saying, giving support to the enemies of Israel who think Israel shouldn't exist at all. That's not what we're saying. We are saying we want Israel to survive. We want Israel to thrive. We want Israel to be a democracy. We want Israel to be a partner with, the, with other democracies around the world. We want Israel to be pluralistic and protect the rights of minorities. We want Israel to be a country that supports peace in the region, in a very dangerous region of the world. Israel can do so much. Israel is so much. Israel is such a partner. And now is our time to have our voice heard. We handed out to you a couple of things. One was uh, a document that talks about some of the ways that you can be helpful, that you can give to organizations that are doing the work in Israel right now, that you can help your friends understand what the situation is about, how important it is, and how important it is that we stand with Israel and with the people of Israel during this time. They are so brave. They are so dedicated. They are so committed to a future of peace. I hope that you can be helpful. And there is also what we handed out, a prayer for democracy of Israel. And I'll invite you to take this home with you and maybe you'll read it at your Seder tables this year during this time out that we're having. And help us remember to pay attention and to be committed. This prayer was written by Rabbi Oded Mazor, the rabbi of the Reformed Congregation in Jerusalem, Kilat Kola Neshama. If you haven't visited there, I encourage you to do so. One of the most vibrant synagogues in Israel and has been for now decades. Um, a really remarkable, remarkable place. Rabbi Mazor writes, O God of our ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, Sarah, Rebecca, Re Jacob, Leah, Bila, and Zilpa, bless those who stand in defense of democracy, equality, and peace. For among our people, from all those all over the world who work to repair society in the face of the threat to the justice system and the rule of law, may the Holy One protect them, save them from all troubles and distress and from every plague and illness from all harassment and injury and any attempt to humiliate them and undermine their commitment. In the fight against indifference, inaction, and non-involvement, may their efforts be successful. May they have a good eye to see wrongs done, a good heart so as not to stand idly by, the strength to act to protect the rights of all, to do justice and bring peace to every person made in the image of God in the world. May the words of the Torah be fulfilled, for because of this thing, God will bless you in all of your efforts and in all of your undertakings. And let us say, Amen. Amen.
Eloheinu Elohea Avotenu Vimotenu, God of our ancestors and God of our descendants. On this Shabbat Hagadol, as we prepare ourselves for Pesach, we're reminded of liberation. May we hold the people of Israel who are standing and hoping for peace, safety, for respect for the rule of law, for democracy to be upheld. May we be among those who stand with her and with her people, with our family, with our friends. Help to strengthen each other and help to be a true guide for the world, for peace and justice. Amen. Amen. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom.